Welcome everyone. Recording everybody. in progress. Okay. It's our friend. That's a good sign. Good to know, right? It didn't sound like Siri, but that was somebody. Yeah, in the cloud. So welcome to our uh, a special meeting this afternoon. Again, sorry for starting a little bit late, but um, we were I was having connection problems. So now I've got two computers and we'll see. Uh, see how that goes. So we'll call our meeting to order. And the first thing we're going to do is we have some directions that help people participate in our meeting. We are live, some of us in the city council chambers. So welcome to our, our public. And then there will be other people participating by Zoom. So we're going to start with our assistant city clerk, who's I think going to start the introduction of just the protocols in the council chambers. Yes. Hello and welcome back. We are glad to be back in our council chamber thanks to our community's lowered COVID-19 case rates and the successful vaccination efforts of many heroes, including our own city staff. The city of Monterey is committed to the safe public attendance of its public meetings. The rules for attending this meeting in person are in accordance with county, state, and federal guidelines. Masks are recommended for all per the county of Monterey Department of Public Health. Masks are required for those who are not fully vaccinated. Exempt are persons younger than two years old. Very young children must not wear a mask because of the risk of suffocation. Persons with a medical condition, mental health condition, or disability that prevents wearing a mask. This also includes uh, people with a medical condition for whom wearing a mask could obstruct breathing or who are unconscious, incapacitated, or otherwise unable to remove a mask without assistance. We also ask that you please keep phones and device speakers muted in order to prevent audio interference and feedback with this hybrid meeting. Thank you. Thank you, MK. And as we carefully return to more normal activities, the city of Monterey seeks to continue to offer virtual methods for public participation options. Governor Newsom's executive order remains in effect, providing greater flexibility for agencies holding public meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you aren't joining us here in person at the city council chambers, there are two ways to virtually participate in our meetings. The first is to join using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device. And the second method is to call directly into the meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom or your computer, smartphone or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at isearchmonterey.org. And since the meeting has already started, you'll find the agenda under the recent tab. To join by telephone, please dial toll-free 833-568-8864, and then enter meeting ID 160-772-9333 pound. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound one more time. Detailed instructions on how to use Zoom is available on our website at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. To make a public comment, please virtually raise your hand using the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And if you've dialed in by phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it's their turn to speak. We will have a time, lim uh, time limit for each of today's agenda items, which we'll be showing using a countdown timer on the screen. And if you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. This meeting is also being streamed live on YouTube with a 10 second delay and also on Comcast Channel 25 with a 90 second delay. And as always, we look forward to receiving public comment this afternoon. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So we'll officially call our meeting to order and we'll point out that all of our council members are here. So your caring city council is Dan Albert and Ed Smith, who are in the chambers with Alan Hoffa and Tyler Williamson joining us through Zoom. And I'm your delighted to be the mayor of Monterey. I'm Clyde Roberson. And so you'll meet some of our outstanding staff as we proceed. First things first, let's uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First part of our agenda is let's see. 
we've got, uh, since it's a special meeting, I don't believe we have uh, general public comments. Matt, I, I noticed in, in uh, your uh, Google Docs that we do have public comments, three minute limit, that, but I think in a special meeting. You're correct. We, we did not update that on the, on the notes, but yes, uh, there is just the public hearing, no public right. comments for items not on today's agenda. Public hearing. So any of the folks who were going to call in and wanted to share some thoughts not on the agenda, please wait till our next meeting or just email us at suggest at monterey.org. Uh, I just heard from one of my neighbors who wanted to convey his appreciation about how responsive city staff is. And, and he said, it's just amazing. And that's, that's not necessarily the standard out there too. We really have a hard, high bar of, of staff responsiveness and public responsiveness. So we're just gonna go right into our public hearing and I'm not gonna do any more uh, introducing other than the world renowned city manager, Hans Uslar, who will be introducing our staff. I will say that we do have the packet, uh, we have 101 pages, all of which we have read. We got a late email from the appellant, which we also have read. So I wanted to assure everyone that we have all of the material and we've had it actually for a couple of weeks now and we have read it and studied it. So I assure you that we do have all of the information in the public record. Hans? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I turn it directly over to our consultant, Mr. Hittleman, Jerry Hittleman. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I will share my screen now, although uh, that's disabled, so I'll have Kim Sh Cole share her screen for the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Jerry, we just uh, changed our settings. You should be able to share your screen now. Oh, great. Okay, thank you very much. Is it one? Yeah. Well, you know, if uh, Jerry, if you uh, pardon me, I do... Uh, I, I do need to back up a, a moment. Did we lose him? There, there is. And I would like to do is just point out the process of the hearing. And so Jerry Huddleman is going to make a press staff presentation of about 10 minutes and the council will ask questions. The applicant presentation, we're assigning 15 minutes. The appellant presentation, 15 minutes. Then we can ask questions of all of the presenters. Then we'll open it up to public comment, three minutes per person. And the applicant rebuttal gets the last word and then we'll, we'll come to our decision. So that will be the order of presentation. So um, again, thanks Nat. So I, I could get us back on process. So back to uh, Jerry, please. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members. The item before you tonight as stated is an appeal of a wire, wireless facility modification. Um, what I'll do is start off talking about the project location and the project history, uh, uh, project description, then the basis for the appeal and then end with our staff recommendation. Project is located at 200 Glenwood Circle. Um, as you can see on the figure in front of you, it is just to the north of Cabrillo Highway <clears throat> on this building. Uh, Glenwood Circle is the private road that comes into the facility. Uh, the exist, you'll see in the figures that I'll show you that the existing antennas are on this roof enclosure on the center part of the roof and right here. <clears throat> what you won't don't see here is that there are a number of solar arrays that were put on the roof after the antennas were installed. So there's large array of solar uh, uh, facilities here and on this part of the roof here as well. Um, okay. Just to give you a little bit of history, the project was originally uh, installed on the rooftop in 2003. There were modifications to the facility in 2012 and 2016. So we did have some modifications. Uh, this latest modification was heard by the Planning Commission on May 11th and appealed on May 14th. And, and subsequently we are here tonight for the appeal hearing. 
go through a brief project description. Uh, you'll see on the plans that I'll show you that this project involves the removal of 11 existing panel antennas, installation of 10 new panel antennas with the retention of one panel antenna. So you'll have a, uh, 11 total and also some new associated support equipment. The ownership is P. Monterey LP. The applicant is Alex Orner, J5 Infrastructure Partners. He's representing New Singular Wireless PCS LLC, also known as AT&T. We have a zoning designation here of planned community and a general plan designation of medium density residential. This is a residential building. Uh, the project review process involves modification to an existing wireless facility. And the purpose is um, the existing antenna signals are blocked by the solar panels on the roof that were installed after the antennas were put in. And they need to be relocated for them to just get their coverage that they initially got in 2003. So their 2003 uh, coverage for cell, phone, cell phones was diminished by the uh, solar panels on the roof. And what they'd like to do is provide improved 4G service as well and to install FirstNet, uh, which is the first responders 4G network. So here's the uh, rooftop view of the building. Uh, as you can see, we do have eight antennas arrayed in a southwest orientation, southeast orientation, and then a northeast orientation on an enclosure on the roof that encloses not only the cell equipment, but other HVAC equipment for the building. These um, grids over here show where the solar panels, panels were installed. So currently they are, are blocking some of the signal coming off these antennas in this direction and this direction as well. What they plan to do is move the antennas from right here to the facade of the building. So there's four antennas in this location. They will be, be replacing it are requesting to replace it with three, actually three new antennas that will be in a screening box on the building facade in this location to the southwest. The antennas on the enclosure pointing to the southeast that aren't blocked, they're just going to replace one, two, three antennas and retain this fourth antenna right there. There are four existing antennas right here that are blocked and they're proposing to one, place them on the building facade right here, one, two, three, four. This is support equipment behind it. So for a little more close up view of what it'll look like on the building facade from a um, site plan angle, here's the boxes with the antennas in them. This is the building facade. And then here's some support equipment on the back. So this is for the Southwest array, one, two, three antennas. Again, um, to the Southeast, these will be retained still on the rooftop enclosure. So we'll have one, two, three antennas, retain this fourth antenna. And then on the Northwest, to the Northwest, we'll have Again, one, two, three, four antennas on the building facade and some support equipment behind it. This shows um, a view towards the southeast elevation. So here's the antennas on the side of the building or on the building facade. And they will project about two and a half feet out from the building. This will be about an eight foot dimension and then about two and a half feet above the roof line. And this will be their remote radio equipment behind it. So that'll occur on those two facades I showed you right here, south, southwest and northwest. And then here's the antennas that will be replaced and retained. One will be retained on the rooftop screening enclosure. 
This is the proposed southwest elevation. So you can see, um, again, here's the building facade. Here's the antenna, one, two, three. The equipment will be behind it. This is the solar panels, and this is the rooftop enclosure on the top of the roof. So it'll be below the rooftop enclosure. Same thing on the Northwest. This is actually a visual of the Northwest that shows how the antennas will be screened in a shrouding box, fiberglass reinforced plastic. It'll be colored to match the building. Uh, again, moving to the Southwest elevation, same thing. They'll be in the boxes. And uh, this is a method that is uh, encouraged in the uh, wireless ordinance. We had them do a view study from Highway 1, and actually the uh, building 200 Glenwood Circle cannot be viewed from Highway 1. The only view is really coming up Glenwood Circle, which would be this view down at the bottom. Uh, actually, when you go to G over here, this is not, cannot be viewed by the public. Only this view is really noticeable from any public roadway. Now, we do have um, quite a few issues brought up in the appeal. I highlighted the colors. The green colors show some of the appeal issues that are not related to um, radio frequency issues. Uh, the orange colored uh, appellant issues are the ones that have to do with FCC regulations, radio frequency regulations. So you can see there are quite a few. And that's what I'll talk about first, and what the appellant brings up. But you see a wide range of issue, anywhere from Brown Act violations to preferred location for wireless facilities and visual impacts that we just went through. So starting with, uh, I'm not gonna go through all the issues, but hit on the main ones for you. So the first one is non-compliance with FCC radio frequency guidelines. The appellant says that the project violate, violates ADA and Fair Housing Act um, RF impacts to surrounding properties and wildlife will result. So the RF study, um, showed that the project complies with Federal Communication Commission regulations, FCC regulations. We, um, just like all projects in the city, we had a third party review by CTC Technologies that verified the compliance with FCC regulations. I'd just like to point out that there is a section in the Federal Telecommunications Act that preempts cities from denying projects based on RF emissions where the projects meet FCC regulations. So we had that third party review. Here is a rooftop view again of the proposed facilities. Um, I'll start off with the legend. The legend shows that blue areas exceed public limits for radio frequency emissions. Uh, the yellow areas exceed occupational standards, and this is um, where it even exceeds them in a, a um, more intense manner. So starting out with the panels on the facade, you can see they do exceed occupational standards, So, but this won't have any access to the public or anybody um, in the building. The rooftop is closed off to only maintenance workers. So if there is a worker working in front of these antennas or around them, they need to be careful uh, or the antennas need to be turned off while they're working on them. Same thing goes for the ones on the roof enclosure in the Southeast orientation. Uh, in the blue area that exceeds the public limit in the yellow area it exceeds the occupational standards. So there will have to be some warning signs and you'll see other methods to make sure that maintenance workers on the roof are not affected. As you can see, it exceeds occupational standards on the north east elevation as well. Now we um, 
had the RF study look at the vertical right. array of uh, the RF emissions. Uh, one thing I want to point out to you is there is a new future residential, whoops, moving back to there, uh, building proposed to the southwest of this existing building. And this shows the outline of the new residential building. We wanted to make sure that none of the um, antennas would affect this new building. So as you can see, this shows how far the occupational standards would go and be exceeded. This shows where the public standards would be exceeded. Anything shown in white around this array or this array totally meets the FCC standard. So we do have um, no exceedance of FCC or radio frequency standards at the new building or anywhere on the ground or anywhere um, offsite. I know the appellant brought up some concerns with uh, effects on Highway 1, Jack's Peak to the, in this direction and Jack's Peak Park but you can see anything beyond this point, 100% meets the FCC standards. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the array on the Southeast, it goes out in this direction. There's no buildings over here. Highway one is much further down here and there is no effect inside the building, which shows total compliance with the FCC standards. And we do have some conditions of approval to make sure that those maintenance workers are safe on the roof. Well, the roof will be locked and access doors will prohibit unauthorized access to the roof area. There will be training for roof workers and RF safety procedures. There'll be signs on the roof explaining um, what areas to stay away from and what to be concerned about. Also, we're uh, requiring that the, the applicant submit a post-construction RF report to show that the figures I just showed you are correct even after the project has been installed. Another appellant issue was the wireless facility location, um, that it is not a preferred location according to pr the present wireless ordinance. That is correct. The proposed project is the modification of an existing wireless facility originally approved prior to adoption of the 2018 or the current wireless facilities code. So it's not a new facility. Um, new facilities would not be allowed in this building, but it is modification of an existing one. And also the building mounting facilities with rooftop mounted and facade mounted antennas are the top two preferred designs for wireless facilities in the Monterey code. And that's exactly what they're doing. Also, um, there was a question whether the project is exempt from CEQA and whether we had to go to a, let's say a mitigated negative declaration or an EIR. However, this um, exemption, section 15303 of the CEQA guidelines was affirmed through a court challenge in 2018 called Don't Sell Our Parks versus City of San Diego. In this case, um, it was a challenge to a 35 foot monopole and support equipment, um, which the city of San Diego found was exempt and the California Court of Appeals affirmed that decision. So again, section, CEQA section 15303 has been applied to similar wireless antenna projects, uh, even in the city of Monterey, such as the eight upper Ragsdale project, which was nine replacement antennas on an existing office building, just as an example. And that was found to be perfectly legal. There are some alternatives you can consider. The city council may elect to grant the appeal if findings can be made based on substantial evidence in the record, or you can approve the appeal with different conditions or modifications to the project if agreed to by the applicant. In conclusion and a recommendation from staff, staff acknowledges the appellant's reasons for the appeal. 
and we addressed each one in the staff report, and I, I hit on some of them in this presentation. Proposed project complies with the Monterey Municipal Code, CEQA, and the FCC RF regulations. Again, Section 704A of the Federal Telecommunications Act preempts cities from denying a wireless project based on RF emissions if the project complies. And based on all the evidence in the record, uh, staff recommends that the city council deny the appeal, affirm the planning commission decision, and adopt a resolution of approving the use permit. Uh, thank you. I'm available for questions. Um, just to let you know, the applicant did bring their RF engineer, who is an expert in RF compliance. Um, and we do have, uh, of course, uh, Kim Cole and other staff members. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hedelman. Uh, before we ask for council questions, we're, I need to ask, since this is a de novo meeting, and that is we're, we're looking at it as if it were the first time, not necessarily just based on the planning commission, but as an independent body. Question is, did we have any ex parte communication? I forgot to ask that. Meaning did any council members talk, which is perfectly legal, but talk to either the applicant or the appellants. This is the time to share any ex parte discussions. No, no, I, no I didn't. Okay. Okay, doesn't sound like there was any. So council questions, uh, please, uh, from the consultant before we go. Yes, Council Member Dan. Um, thank you for your presentation. I uh, appreciate all the work that was put into this with the staff and, and everyone else that's involved. So I do have a question about uh, the rays that are um, on the same wall as the, uh, the occupants of the, of the apartments that are there. Has the property owners notified those occupants that those arrays will be right outside their, their uh, apartment complex? Yeah, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, all the residents in the building were notified of the project by the prop property owner. So that would include those with the arrays um, uh, outside their, their units. So a follow-up question, was there any of those uh, occupants, uh, um, were, were, they, um, were they concerned about the arrays at all? Or was there any complaints about it? Or did anybody uh, want to move their, their apartment because of them that are coming up? Or uh, We did not hear any, any complaints. And I don't believe we received any written or oral communication to that effect. Or, or from anyone in the apartment, for that matter. Correct. Okay, thank you. That was my only question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Can somebody read, please? Yeah, thank you. Mr. Hillman, uh, we've got the, the map that I wanted to refer to, the exposure view from southeast. And uh, I think the other one was the southwest. But um, you've indicated the uh, blue exceeds public, the yellow exceeds occupational, and you have the height which is uh, very helpful, but it does not show how far out the uh, exceeding the uh, public blue exceeds from the building. Do we have any figures that tell us, uh, like on this map that show or the picture that showed now, uh, the one that is on the far right of the corner of the building, the blue uh, kind of goes all the way to the end of the photo. How far out from the building does the blue go? Um, Yes, we have a little bit of a scale down down below here. So yeah, my apologies. If you can interpret it, it's hard to see on our screen. No, I I, I understand. Um, I can see it this, from this distance to here is twenty feet. So I would estimate that's about twenty, forty, sixty, maybe sixty-five, seventy feet out in this direction and a little bit less out in this direction because this is only three antennas, this is four antennas. Okay. And uh, back to the Southwest photo, if we could look at that one more time. Um, that one is looking like it's going a little further. Can you estimate out from the building how far that one goes? And again, you said the white, sky, the white is indicating that there's no structures. That's correct. There's no structures. This is pointing more in the direction of um, Highway 1. So let's see, about 20, 40, 
I would say 60 feet or so, probably 65, maybe between 65 and 70 feet. Okay. And then uh, kind of connected to Dan uh, Albert's question on the residents, the southwest corner of that building, the blue um, exceeds public, looks to be like it is directly in front of that one uh, unit. Likewise on Southeast. Um, so these locations um, come and go as time is. Uh, is there any requirement that the applicant uh, have something that is a legacy piece that goes with the, the location address so for future tenants would know? Is that required by the applicant? Uh, that's a good question. We don't have it as a project condition right now, so I don't know from a legal standpoint if they would have to disclose what's on the rooftop to all, all residents or anybody that exchanges units or comes into the building. But that might be um, something that would be required under uh, real estate law, I would think. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I have one follow-up question? Yes, on? please, Council Member Dan. Could you go back a slide real quickly? Uh, one, no, it was the other way, I think. There. You see the, um, I guess it's uh, down below where the the uh, exceeds public blue kind of goes through. Does that go through a room there? Or what? what mm -hmm. How does that work there? I believe what they're trying, trying to show here is that the Building materials, I don't know if you remember the two Portola Plaza project, but the building materials in that case and in this case actually block the radio frequency emission in this case. So this would be below the public limit in any area that you see here that's white. So it doesn't it, it doesn't go through those walls and connects, it just goes across and down, I assume. Exactly. Okay. All right, that's that was my question. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, good. Uh, I can't see on the screen. So I've, I've got a question, Mr. Mayor. Yes, that's what I was going to ask uh, Council Member Allen or Council Member Tyler, since I don't see you on my screen here. Council Member Allen, please. Um, so my line of question is kind of from the same point of view as Councilman Dan, and has to do with concern with those units directly adjacent to the facade and I guess the uh, the transmitters on the facades. So have, and this might be for the proponent's attorney when they speak, but have there been tests done? First of all, have this similar kind of um, locate, locating of transmitters adjacent to um, habitable, habitable units been done elsewhere and did they test after the um, installation inside the unit? Um, because again, I, I mean, I understand in theory that, that the um, radiation moves outward um, and in theory that building materials can block it. But I think I, I would, I would appreciate some specific data on the inside of those particular units. So that would be one question. And then the second question is, um, did they consider simply elevating the existing ones above, um, above the solar arrays or elevating above the solar arrays and putting in the new, the new, uh, the new facility rather than moving to the side of the building? So those are my two questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Alan. Excellent questions. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, to answer the second question first, um, to go above the building in this location would not be in conformance with the ordinance in terms of um, meeting visual impacts and things like that. So that's why they went out in this location over here. And I'll have to have the um, applicant answer if it would still be blocked, even if they put it up higher on the enclosure back in this location by the solar arrays, because I think they 
do need some, uh, let me go back to this figure. They probably need some uh, um, coverage in this direction as well. So maybe it can't go high enough to do that. But I'll, I'll, have, I'll leave that up to them. Um, the question about whether we have a similar arrangement, I'm trying to recall if the two Portola Plaza Hotel had, I may have had some antennas that were adjacent to hotel rooms. So that might be an example for you where this was done before and all emissions go in this direction. And I don't believe any go back in this direction at all. But uh, well, let's so, and that. so that would be the question. Is there any evidence or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. data they can point to that shows that there's absolutely zero emissions in the other direction? Which yeah, would be towards the unit. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I believe there is not anything, any emissions in the other direction, but I'll they do have an expert with the applicant team and we'll ask him the same question. Okay, uh, Council Member Tyler, any questions at this point? You no, know, my colleagues got to everything that I was going to raise, so I'm I'm going to defer for now. All right, good. Yeah, excellent questions. So at this point, we'll listen to the applicant, and possibly the applicant can answer the questions that were proposed, or we will ask them again as necessary. And so at this point, we'll turn it over to the applicant. So Nat, this is Kim Cole. The applicant is Alex Orner and he's one of the attendees with his hands raised. Okay, great. Good, thanks, Kim. Yeah, thank you, Kim. That's very helpful. I will promote him to panelist at this time and uh, then we'll allow him to, uh, to speak. And if he has a PowerPoint, he can share it as well. Mr. Orner, are you there? Hi, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Ah, perfect, perfect. I was talking to myself. Um, so good evening. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, Jerry did a great job explaining the project. I can just help fill in some of the blanks um, with the assistance of our third party expert from Hammond and Edison, who can speak to all the EME questions. Um, but the one question uh, that council member Allen had asked about asking to go higher. Um, so we, uh, just a, actually a quick background, just um, to add on to what Jerry had uh, presented. So we've been working on this project for three and a half years. There have been a number of different designs that we've looked at. Our options were quite limited. Um, one of the first options we did look at when we realized that there was a solar panel issue um, was going higher. Uh, the problem, uh, there were two issues with, with going higher. One, the technology changed. So our, our RF engineer, who they're, they're the ones responsible for um, achieving their, um, uh, their coverage objectives. Uh, with the technology changing over time, the building was, uh, the, the way it's formatted, um, to clear the, the lip of the building, we had to go significantly higher. And so we're, we're talking, it couldn't just be raised a few feet and then you know, extend the screening. We would have had to go uh, at least 20, 30 feet up, which would just, it, it just would not, first of all, aesthetically, it would look terrible. And second of all, support it and just that that area is a, a wind tunnel. It just wasn't a, a feasible design option. So that's what led us to move to the edge of the building. And then we stealth the antennas to um, aesthetically blend into the building. So I can answer any other questions about uh, design or raising the antenna, but if you, uh, to answer the questions about the EME, I, I would defer to um, Raj with Hammett and Edison, who's on this, uh, who's uh, connected remotely. I don't have any other aesthetic questions, but it would be good to hear from Raj. 
Yeah, so Matt, if you could stop the clock and then promote Rajat Mathir to a panelist, please. Thank yep, you. Do let me uh, find that screen here somewhere in uh, just one moment. Uh, we'll allow him to speak and actually promote him to panelist now. Mr. Mathur. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And we can even yeah. see you. How about that? Well, we did for a moment. <laughs> we, keep, we keep him on so we can get rid of the clock. Yep, sure. I'll have the clock going in the background. Uh, go ahead. See people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good evening again. My name is uh, Raj Mathur. I'm with Hammett and Edison. Uh, we are an independent consulting engineering firm located in Sonoma, and I am a licensed professional electrical engineer in the state of California. And I'll jump to directly to answering some of the questions that I heard uh, uh, from uh, Commissioner Allen. Um, the first question I think was regarding um, the building materials and the blockage of the signal. Uh, and, and yes, we've measured that many, many times. Uh, there are many facilities that are located on rooftops um, uh, similar to this facility. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, building materials uh, typically reduce the signal anywhere from 10 times uh, up to 20, 30 times. Uh, and so there is a severe attenuation of the signal uh, from building materials. And the second question, I believe, was regarding the directionality of the antenna uh, and if uh, indeed levels uh, behind into the sides of the antennas uh, were as low as theoretically shown uh, in our modeling. And, and the answer to that also is, is yes, there is. Uh, these antennas are extremely directional. Uh, we've measured thousands of them over um, the last 30 years. Um, and there is very, very little energy uh, behind the antennas and to the sides of the antennas and above and below the antennas. The antenna's energy goes out in a narrow beam out towards the horizon, uh, which is kind of what you see in those images with the blue and the yellow. Uh, and I'll stop there, but I'm happy to elaborate on any of these items or answer any of the questions you may have on radio frequency exposure. That answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I don't know if... Uh, the applicants, uh, either one of you, were, would be the one that addressed the question that several council members brought up, and that was respect to the impact on the closest units. One, were they noticed? Secondly, was the whole building noticed? Thirdly, uh, is there a way to measure what kind of uh, RF may be in the closest units to the antenna? So that, that was a, a concern of, that was raised. Yeah, I, I can take the last one um, regarding uh, regarding measuring. And uh, as, as Jerry noted, there is a requirement for for post construction measurements, uh, and we and that's that's a fairly common requirement. And so we have several calibrated meters uh, where we which we take and we can measure in rooftops. We can measure in apartments, uh, and uh, you know basically we can measure anywhere we can go. Uh, and we do that all the time, and uh, we'd be happy to do that here. Um, the the other questions you had regarding noticing, I'd, I'll defer those to either Alex or or, or Jerry. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll field that one. Um, so uh, J Five Infrastructure Partners, the company that I work for, we're working. Uh, we have been working directly with ownership, and we were informed that. They had sent uh, notice to all residents, so they have been made aware of this project. Okay, good. Now, did you want to make any more presentation, or just are you open to questions? I'm just open to questions. All right. Any uh, questions? Uh, Councilmember Tyler, Councilmember Allen, Dan, Matt. Okay, the applicant. All right. If if there's nothing well, else, I did have a question. I thought maybe Tyler and Dan did too, so I was waiting. Okay. I don't know, uh, Tyler. Yeah. Go ahead. Council member Tyler. Go ahead, Alan. Okay, thanks. So to the uh, um, project proponent, so would you object if we included a requirement that there be a post construction, that you do a post construction test of the, um, of the uh, RF inside the units? 
inside the units? Yeah, I think for me, that's just to be upfront, that's kind of my biggest concern. I hear what the engineer says, but I think it would still, if I, if my grandparent or my mother were living in one of those units, I would feel a lot more comfortable if you did a post-construction test to confirm that there really was no dangerous RF there. Uh, but perhaps I could maybe jump in here a little bit. Um, and yep. so there are uh, some jurisdictions do have that requirement. One example is San Francisco. They require that uh, nearby residents uh, be notified and uh, offer measurements. And, and you know, we can certainly do that here. Um, and so typically what we do is we'll, we'll send out um, certified mail to them saying, you know, we're available to take measurements at your residence. Uh, and obviously, we can't barge into their homes, and uh, but we do offer that. And then, then if they call us or email us and say, yes, we'd like the measurements, then we then we go do them. So, uh, you know, we'd be happy to, to do that, do that here if that if that satisfies what you're looking for. Thank you. Hey, uh, Council Member Tyler. Nope, nothing here. Okay. Oh, if I can just ask uh, sure. Council one other Dan. question. I think it was uh, Councilmember Smith that mentioned if there was any potential um, renters in the in the future, whether we could uh, uh, require them to notify these potential renters that outside their apartments are in tenants. So I'm wondering if uh, that's legal we can do that or we can't do that. Require the owners to notify potential renters is that what you were saying also yeah i i think maybe it's a question for the um our legal counsel okay. if you know i understand the project and when the project is done there's this the applicant is still there but for the applicant to take on the owner's responsibility of keeping track of who's coming and who's going it really is the building owner's responsibility yeah. but i i don't know what the best way to do that is but i kind of feel like you and Alan, we're speaking is that in five years when, um, you know, somebody uh, moves into that, how are they given the ability to know that uh, there's something right outside that right outside their building or right outside their window? So I think it's really incumbent on the building owner, but I don't know how we impose that. So it's a question yeah. for the legal team. So maybe we bring that up. In and discussion. It might not be possible. I just wanted yeah. to, to remind him that yeah. that was a question. Yeah, but I think that's a, a question that's still lingering in my mind after we hear from uh, the uh, um, next person that that's wants to address the uh, uh, the appeal. Okay. Thank you. That was it. Okay, good question. So when we do close the public hearing and bring it back to the council, we'll want to discuss yeah. the legal requirement of future tenants notification. Yeah and find out if that's something that we can ask as a condition. So seeing that the applicant, and we have no more questions, the applicant will have the opportunity for a rebuttal later. At this point, we would invite our appellant. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, welcome to our meeting where the floor is yours. Good afternoon, my name is Neil I just want to say a housekeeping detail um, up front. It's very difficult to prepare for a, uh, a presentation such as this. Mayor, the audio on this side is not too well. We can't hear. Okay, so timer started again. Thank you. Um, That's better. Beatty, um, I just want to make a housekeeping detail. It's very difficult to prepare a presentation. Um, when there's no time uh, given in advance. Um, last two presentations that I've made here were been uh, 10 minutes. I was given 10 minutes, again, not given that information in advance. And tonight I'm being given 15 minutes. Um, so it's, uh, you'll have to forgive my being slightly unprepared for that because I didn't know until this meeting. Um, the, um, I uh, I want to start with saying that this project um, in the limit in the time that I do have this project and the staff recommendations violate federal, state, and local laws, including the wireless um, ordinance, um, as I've laid out in my appeal and additional grounds. 
uh, staff mischaracterizes my appeal and the issues I raise. Um, staff's actions have the effect of eliminating civil rights laws, overriding Congress, and rewriting the Telecommunications Act and federal laws. Staff has ignored key sections in federal communications rules that I've repeatedly shown them and you um, that other laws are not superseded, and yet city staff gives away congressionally designated authority of the city to, to, to the benefit of applicants. That is the public's trust that's being thrown away. For instance, staff never mentions TCA section 601C1. Um, no implied effect. It says, this act and the amendments made by this act shall not be construed to modify, impair, or supersede federal, state, or local laws unless expressly so provided in such acts or amendments. Where are these rules that staff says no longer apply that are expressly modified, impaired, and superseded in the TCA, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act and Americans with Disability Amendments Act, the Fair Housing Act and Fair Housing Amendments Act, the Migratory Bird Act, the Endangered Species Act, Monterey's Wireless Ordinance, Public Utilities Code 7901, California Building Code, California Civil Code 54, et cetera, et cetera. Where are they expressly mentioned in the TCA that they are preempted. The TCA requires specific mention. This attempt to block these laws is unlawful. Staff also doesn't tell you about 47 USC 414, which says that the Communications Act does not abridge or alter the remedies found in other laws, remedies such as protection from discrimination for disabled persons. Staff doesn't tell you about dual regulatory authority over cell towers in the TCA that you have with very few exceptions. Staff says you have almost no authority. Staff also doesn't mention T-Mobile versus San Francisco or Sprint versus San Diego, which I have provided copies here and provided in the past. These rulings affirm local government authority. Staff also doesn't mention the Abrams holding of the U.S. Supreme Court on the legal remedies link limited to what is in the TCA, expedited legal review. The project does not comply with all FCC regulations. Staff cherry-picked which section it wants to enforce that favor the applicant. Other sections which affirm your authority as well as local, state, and federal laws are ignored. This cherry-picked information gives a false background for your decision-making, and you are frequently told your hands are tied. I'm disabled by electromagnetic sensitivity as disability is defined by the ADA, ADAA and state equivalent rules. This project denies my access and my civil rights. The blocked access includes streets, highway, the highway, my home, my neighborhood, grocery shopping, health care and other essential services, state and federal facilities, and free movement and association. Staff has discriminated against me as a disabled person for 13 years. I am forced to exercise my rights in a room that is toxic to me because staff knowingly install wireless internet that is an access barrier to me. Staff mischaracterizes my appeal as health effects. The city violates ADA, FHA, and state equivalent rules and mischaracterizes the laws repeatedly. Staff tells you that ADA, ADAA, and Fair Housing Amendments Act and state law and the definitions by the California legislature, Congress, and DOJ don't apply to me but only apply to some disabled people. Though I provided the city with a text, in many cases, the staff refuses to read it, but repeats the same false statements that even a non-attorney such as myself can see by a plain reading of the text. The only possible reason is to avoid their responsibilities. They are not held accountable by anyone. FirstNet grossly discriminates against me and others disabled like me wherever it is installed. It goes, on be, it goes far beyond the exclusion acts, like the Chinese Exclusion Act and the discriminatory laws in, in Oregon to ban African Americans because the radiation of this, quote, safety project excludes me from living anywhere and threatens my life. It penetrates buildings and homes miles away by design and causes serious life-threatening exacerbation of my disability and that of other EMF disabled persons. The Commerce Department ignored ADA and fair housing issues in their rush to subsidize this industry. Despite testimony by numerous Monterey City residents on disabling impacts from wireless radiation, staff adopted FirstNet in what appears to be a behind-the-scenes sweetheart deal that was not reasoned decision-making. There was no public process 
I'm still waiting for information on its adoption. It causes a significant change in the human environment with new, intense, unavoidable power levels and signal characteristics. This required environmental impact review, but this was not done. I and others disabled like me were not contacted as vital stakeholders when this project was considered. So-called educational benefits are spurious and specious. Fiber to the premises and especially copper-based cable internet are superior in speed, security, and safety and available in the city. This is a public subsidy of a private company. Instead of making specious complaints, claims about me, the actual recipient of special treatment and subsidy is the applicant. The project is not compliant with Monterey Municipal Code because it's, it's not compliant with ADA, fair housing and state equivalencies. The city has no basis or medical or scientific qualifications to make the multiple claims that this project is not, quote, detrimental to the public health and safety and welfare and not have a significant direct or cumulative impact on residents. The city has no qualifications to say that compliance with FCC limits means that these exposures are safe or that they ensure the safety of persons in the vicinity. The general public does not include disabled persons like myself as regards exposure guidelines. The city only considers property owners interested persons that are entitled to due process. The city denied access and due process rights to hundreds of Monterey residents, including elderly and frail residents. They are quote, interested persons. Monterey's unequal income-based classist rule based in the 1700s and 1800s norms was discriminatory and wrong when it was adopted. It makes a mockery of freedom, justice, and equality for all. Planning commissioners stated they don't have an understanding of the laws. I bring to their attention major civil rights laws that staff never informs them about. I have provided with specificity laws and code sections to the city that are not preempted by the Telecommunications Act or the FCC. And I ask that all references I have made in my appeal and related documents be included in their entirety. My appeal is on point. The city council has to decide if it'll throw into the trash the dual regulatory authority given to the people of the city by Congress or violate civil rights laws as your staff encourages you to do. City acts with prejudice toward the applicant and violation of laws so that you can't make a decision based on facts. In re reference to the purpose of the project, you cannot rely on the applicant to disclose it, nor does it give the public any rights because as you've now been informed by staff, the applicant to do whatever they want with the technology. And if it's 4G, 5G, 6G, whatever G, they can do it. And the city has no, the city residents have no rights, but staff has told the city residents in the past, oh yes, there will be a hearing. And now we're being told there won't be a hearing. The effect of that was to make people go away. And they did go away because they thought they would have due process in the future, but now they're told they're not. The liability for the city in permitting, which is rubber stamping, ignoring its responsibility and dual regulatory authority also comes into play when there's no EMF hazard insurance. Claims of um, limited authority and only maybe aesthetics being the city's purview are false, according to Congress and according to the California Supreme Court. And I want to go into specific issues since I have more time, and I would like to preserve some time for rebuttal. Um, that has been given to appellants in the past, and I'd like to know if I have ability to rebut in tonight. Um, the, um, the city uh, uh, consultant misquoted federal te telecommunications law. He said that denying projects is preempted by the federal act. And let me quote you the Cellular Telephone Industry Associations, who is the industry of the industry. Let me tell you what they said about federal law. And they quote the federal law, this particular section. In fact, they go back to history, Congress's intent to the co committee report when they were formulating the TCA. And this is a quote from the uh, lawsuit that CTIA filed against Berkeley. Therefore, the committee concluded no state or local government solely on the basis of RF emissions should block the construction of sites and facilities or installation of equipment which comply with FCC RF limits. So this is what Congress said, that RF was, could, could be used as an argument in particular projects. And then they say, CTI says, that legislative admonition was codified in Section 332C7 of the Act, which provides that no state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless facilities on the basis of environmental effects. It does not say denying projects. It says regulate these the technology. 
Secondly, I'd like to urge the, um, the consultant to reread the um, email that was in your packet, which he queried the uh, applicant's engineer and said, is there radiation going into the building? Apparently, he forgot that he got that email, but it's in your packet. And it's, yes, the radiation does go into the, the, uh, the building, um, and it's very significant. Um, and I'm, I'm confused that information that's, that he actually used is or uh, queried for, he's forgetting this. So I'm just questioning what the other, given the other inaccuracies in the staff report, um, why we're not getting a full picture. We're not getting a cohesive picture. Secondly, um, you do get a post-construction test, um, at least externally to the building. That's in the code. Everyone should know that. Um, the purpose also, um, if there's no radiation going from the antennas into the building, then there's obviously no cell phone coverage, and the purpose of the project is gone away. So all these um, claims about concrete protecting, blah, 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 these are very, very high levels outside the building and a high percentage, as the engineer even admitted, that they would be reduced somewhat, perhaps, but not um, markedly. Um, Again, I apologize. I was prepared for 10 minutes. I was not prepared for 15 because I was not notified that in advance of the meeting. How many more minutes do I have? Is there a timer somewhere? May I preserve the rest of these for um, any rebuttal after the applicant speaks? We'll have to check, Nina. Uh, no. I don't think we can do that by uh, public hearing standards. Okay. So. This would be all right. Well, then I will finish up um, the inaccuracies, um, the um, misstatements of laws that anyone can read, including a non attorney. This is the people's law. Um, the inaccuracies in the report um, about um, just a variety of things, the mischaracterization of my appeal, um, rephrasing things as health effects. Um, if a person wants to have access to this building and wants a ramp, um, that's not health effects. That's disabled access. That's civil rights. And so when I'm saying that my home is blocked, that's a violation of Fair Housing Act. That's not health effects. Now, by posing it, by phrasing it this way, um, staff is trying to move this into an area that's so supposedly you can't do anything about, whereas you are tasked and the TCA is absolutely silent on the issue of ADA and for housing because that's another federal law. It has never said, Congress did not say anything about that any of these are precluded. Um, and so I, um, I urge you to uphold the laws in their entirety, the California state laws, the wireless ordinance, the federal laws that protect civil rights, that protect the equal rights of people to access to the highway, to the roads, to their homes, to their neighborhoods, to free association, um, to essential services. This facility is blocking, will block my access. The first facility, there is a proliferation. This is a system and we now have, this is the third, of this system that's been uh, that's being considered. This is a proliferation, a new proliferation of equipment. And it went two miles away and about half the power easily penetrated my home and I could tell when it was turned on. It exacerbated my disability. So it's already that one facility is blocking access to my home. So this one is closer and about twice the power. So I ask you to uphold the law. Um, to assert your dual regulatory authority and deny this project. It does not comply with the laws. Thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation. I, I think this is the uh, point where we're going to go out for public comment. Did we have any questions for Ms. Beatty, uh, Council? Uh, I, I do have one, one quick question. and um, For Ms. Beatty? Yeah, for Ms. Beatty and maybe yeah, uh, Beattie, yeah. uh, others who are rep representing the application for the construction. Would you uh, be willing to answer a question for us? Absolutely. 
It's it's a pretty brief one. Nina, you mentioned that there was a report that the engineers had that was showing that there was a high level um, of RF going into the building inside of a room. Yes. Uh, was that in a document presented? Yes. Okay. It's in your packet. It's behind. Unfortunately, it's not a separate attachment, but it's behind okay. your um, the RF report and the noise report. If you you page through that, it's the it's the those are the emails after that. Okay, so uh, is there an email from one of the engineers representing the project that yes. is talking about that? This was Mr. Hittleman emailing and saying the appellant says um, that there's radiation uh, going. So would you please verify? You know, say what what's what's uh, what? And again, this is modeling. This isn't measuring. And mm -hmm. so Hammond and Edison replied back, and that's in your packet. Okay, and those were emails correspondence between the construction applicant and the and RF Hittleman. engineer. Mr. Hittleman, yeah. Okay, thank you, Nina. Any other questions for Ms. Beatty? All right, thank you. Well, let's uh, uh, open it up to the public. Anyone in the public here in the council meeting want to comment? Okay. Uh, say that will. Uh, see if anyone's online. Uh, yes, on, and just to just to clarify uh, that uh, call in number is eight three three five six eight 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 six four, and the webinar ID is one six zero one two five three three four zero pound. And uh, we'll take the first caller. Last three digits of their phone number is nine zero nine, and we just ask that they please dial star six. Good afternoon, council members. I also have uh, electromagnetic uh, sensitivities that qualify as a disability under the American Disabilities Act. My name is Diane Nickel. Um, I do like to shop at the Del Monte Center. Although I don't live in Monterey, I do go there regularly. I like to shop there and I also like to attend a church in that neighborhood for certain purposes. Um, I'm gonna read you from the United States Access Board Electro, uh, this is quote unquote recommendations for accommodations. People with chemical and or electromagnetic sensitivities can experience debilitating reactions from exposure to extremely low levels of common chemicals and from electromagnetic fields emitted by computers, cell phones, and other electronic electrical equipment. So it is recognized by the US government, electromagnetic sensitivities. It's recognized as a disability. And by installing this, FirstNet system, it will increase the background radiation of this neighborhood, and that will limit right my access and will reduce my desire to spend my money in Monterey County shopping, attending the church, etc. So I ask you to please approve appellant's application or uh, approve her appeal and deny the FirstNet. There are many like us. There's at least 10 to 15 percent of the population is electromagnetically sensitive. I thank you for that. Thank you for your comments. And uh, we will pause the timer and uh, find the next caller here, uh, Jean Rash. Hi, Jean. Welcome. Hi. Hi, council members. Hello, Jean. Um, I'm, I am well, I don't get affected yet by electromagnetic radiation, but I have such procedural concerns. Um, one, I wish it wasn't, the meeting wasn't today, that it was tomorrow or a Tuesday or an easier day for all of us. Um, but I'm very concerned that you can be a resident in a senior living facility and not get noticed that this is going on. I maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But um, we should be amending any of our ordinances that do not um, stipulate that residents must receive notice so that they can participate in all these proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. On to our next caller, and that will be uh, Bob Tilden. Welcome, Bob. Hi, thanks for uh, letting me uh, ask a question. This is, I think, is probably for the applicant. I think in your um, 
uh, original, the drawing that was on the screen, uh, the RF exposure from, I think it was the Southwest. Um, it seems like in the current arrangement uh, where the, uh, the the panel antennas are uh, in, you know, or rather the solar panels are in front of the panel antennas that that would present a hazardous, much more hazardous situation for utility workers or maintenance personnel uh, and that by moving them to the outside of the building, it actually would make that rooftop environment safer. Could the applicant or Mr. Hittleman uh, comment on that? And when we close the public hearing, we'll get that answer for you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for asking it. Great. Thank you for your comments. And we will go back and see we have no other uh, members of the public who are have their hands raised for this item back to you mr mayor okay thank you we'll close that section of the public hearing bring it back to the council so there were a, one of the questions which was raised uh, by me i'm sorry mayor i think there was an opportunity for rebuttal by the um uh, understood the applicant okay thank you uh, thank you <laughs> appreciate that but i just wanted to the applicants would be able to address the questions that were brought up by the public one was the notification where all of the residents noticed. I believe we covered that, but let's cover it again. That was one of the questions. And the second question had to do with respect to would the rooftop actually be safer with this new configuration? And so I think those were the two questions that I heard. And so with that, we are going to go to the applicant which who has an opportunity to have the final word, make a rebuttal, answer the questions that were brought forward by the public. So to the applicant, please. Sorry, I'm just coming back on. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I have no, um, I have no objections to any of the comments. Uh, I can defer to Raj about the safety of moving the antennas to the outside of the building. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to Raj on that one. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, just touching on that real brief, briefly. Uh, is Bob, Bob is correct that uh, when the antennas where they are now, kind of on the center of the roof, um, levels uh, will likely exceed the FCC limits uh, on the roof in front of the antennas, and so moving them to the side of the building uh, does eliminate that condition, and uh, the less a lesser area on the roof now exceeds the uh, the FCC limits. Uh, and then I just want to really uh, just really quickly touch on the other uh, the other question where there was uh, um, uh, some discussion on emails between uh, Jerry and, and Hammett and Edison. And I believe what was referred to, what's being referred to is um, our response to, to Jerry when he was asking uh, some questions regarding, um, regarding questions from the appellant of what the exposure levels would be within the building uh, and our response, and I'm just, I'm just gonna read it here. Uh, we calculate that the RF exposure levels within the building on the top floor uh, would be 8.3% of the FCC limit. Uh, what that means is that the, we calculate levels to be about 12 times below the limit within the building. And then we also did an additional calculation uh, for someone on the balcony uh, of that building. Uh, and there we calculated levels to be uh, Forty-three percent of the FCC limit, so about half the FCC limit. And I'll add, lastly, that uh, these are worst-case calculations. Uh, when we take measurements, like uh, is a conditional approval here, uh, we typically measure levels that are significantly lower than what we are calculating. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, happen. there was one more question uh, with respect to can we require new tenants to be informed yes, about right. uh, going there? And I think uh, Mr. Joe Van Eaton uh, is on the line, and uh, I hope that Joe can answer that question. Yes, we did have a legal question. Can we get that answered now? Thank you for that. Yeah, unfortunately on that one, I can't really tell you the answer. What, what I would suggest to you is this. We do know there are disclosure requirements associated with any real estate sale. And there's been some debate in the past when, uh, uh, as to whether that was required whenever you put up a wireless facility, say near somebody's house or near somebody's antenna. The question I think you're asking though is, 
could the city itself, if it's not already covered by standard real estate law, could the city itself adopt something that requires notice? And that I don't know the answer to. I think we'd have to. <laughs> uh, my colleague, Andrew McArdle, is also on. Andrew, we, have you looked at that by any chance? Uh, no, that's not something I've dealt with either. Uh, I was thinking similarly to you in terms of how it, it could potentially be handled, but um, it's certainly something we, we could look into if needed. But it is, it is, I think the comment that it's a real estate question is the right answer, that it's going to have to be part of a contract with respect to the rental or, or sale of the property. All right. Thank you for that answer. All right. So we'll then uh, we'll, we'll bring it back to the council. I know uh, some council members, uh, Alan, you specifically had a, a concern, I think, that you wanted to add if this is yeah I, I i feel like um I, I don't see a reason to deny the um proposal or put it another way i don't see a legal grounds to support the appeal but i do feel like and it sounds like the um applicant is open to this including a provision of um approval that would require them to notify the um uh at least the first floor or the re the residents of the units adjacent to the um adjacent to the uh transmitters and offer them post construction testing if they would like it um, so basically consistent with what Mr. Raj um, outlined. Yes, that's what I heard too, that they were willing to do that. So I would ask the applicant, is that the way you heard it and understand it as well? It is. I would just like to stress that I, I think that should be an option because some residents may not want, um, you know, a third party in their home and it, it is a, a retirement home. So they may prefer. Practice. Understood but that you would contact them and, and give them that option subject to their um, well, we decision. Can work with, we can work with ownership, but yeah, I, I would prefer it would go through the owner and not the applicant myself. Okay, and then, so hearing that, maybe, um, maybe Chrissy or Mr. Van Eaton can help us with some language. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how other people feel, but that's it, maybe we should wait to hear from everybody first, but that's, that, that's what I'm thinking. Well, Alan, and I would just throw out on top of that, that if the concern is potentially not a, a, a current um, uh, a tenant doesn't want uh, them coming in, that the requirement would be once the unit is vacated to do the test at that time or, or something like that. And if, again, if, if we have that legal authority, I, I, I would agree that would be preferable. We'll look into that. Uh, may I ask a question of uh, one of the experts? Absolutely. Um, so how often are RF tests done for ongoing maintenance in the future? So once construction is done, you do an RF test. Then after that, is there like an every year warranty, every three years warranty? How, how is the health and safety of the equipment maintained after construction? So that's a um, uh, question from Council Member Ed to either Mr. Edelman or the applicants, or both. Uh, there's no there's no standard. I mean, it varies by jurisdiction. Some implement every five years. Some jurisdictions implement every year testing. Um, Raj, I know you have a little more expertise in this area because you guys are the ones actually running uh, post construction reports. Yeah, I'm happy to elaborate on that. And so, like Alex said, it varies from jurisdictions. Some have requirement for periodic testing, some, some don't. My, my personal opinion is that um, once you test for a condition once after a proposed modification, um, it, it doesn't really change when we go back. We're just measuring basically the same thing. Uh, and so unless there's a modification or something changes, uh, with uh, you know, with the antennas or with the equipment, uh, then we're basically measuring the same thing again. Um, and so that's you know that's my opinion. That's based on experience of doing these. 
uh, that it requires some kind of change from the wireless operator to their operation for us to see anything uh, in our meters that's, uh, that's a change. Ho hopefully, that, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, Council member Dan. Um, so on several occasions, not only uh, Mrs. Beatty uh, brings it up, but also someone called in about the American Disabilities Act. Can I just get an explanation from the staff why the staff doesn't believe this is a violation of the ADA and it's in, in compliance or, or from one of our, our uh, legal team? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I point to the Assistant City Attorney, Karen, or to Joe Van Eaton, if one of you guys please respond. And again, let me let me give it in two parts. First, the first is that the provision, and, and Ms. Beatty wrote, 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 raised the point that the act preempts, uh, that expressly, that anything, any, any case where local authority is expressly preempted, it's preempted. And the provision she quotes says you cannot regulate based on the environmental effects of RF radiation. You cannot regulate. And the courts that have looked at this have uniformly concluded that means you cannot deny based on the RF impacts. Now, I'm going to ask my colleague, Andrew McArdle, who's uh, also uh, uh, been working on some of this about we, we've done some ADA analysis because this issue does come up all the time. Andrew? Yeah, thanks, Joe. So, yeah, as you said, th this issue has come up in, in a few cities uh, and localities now. And if, from what we can gather in, in all of our research, uh, you know, the DOJ's ADA website, it, it doesn't give any indication uh, that RF sensitivity or sickness um, is, is something that's covered. Uh, in, in addition, and I believe this is mentioned in the in materials of the staff report, but uh, it's it, there's, there's no... Uh, services or programs or activities uh, that would be, you know, at issue here. So uh, from what we can tell, you know, RF sensitivity is not yet listed as something uh, covered or envisioned to be covered by, by the ADA, at least with respect to the DOJ's website. And, and I, I think the main point really is that at the permitting process, as far as we can tell, this is not something where your action here would trigger an ADA violation. Thank you, Nina. Something you could regulate. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we're going to continue to point of order. It really addresses if there's uh, incorrect procedures. It doesn't mean that that doesn't, uh, point of order is for a procedural, as it's not. To, and I respect your, your viewpoint and, and your disagreement with what you just heard. We respect that and we heard it. All right, so we're back at the council. Is anyone ready to uh, make a motion that can encapsulate what the council's concerns and direction is? Anybody want to try that one? So, um, Mayor, can, before we go to uh, a call for something, uh, I've got one piece here in the staff work I'm still trying to. Uh, figure out what it says, and it has to do with um, its packet page, um, let's see, 19, packet page 19, and it's uh, correspondence between uh, the engineers, and it's reference to the information about whether there's RF in the rooms, and I think this highlights the discussion about the question and emails were going back. So I, I just want to get a clarity on this. Um, and there is a response. So if in, all those want to look at this, um, it is on packet page 19 and mid range here, the question on appellate issue 21. Um, and the, the question is the RF exposure exceeds occupational limits over the rooms on the Southeast azimuth and the building at the southwest and northwest azimuths what are the measurements or percentages calculated for those rooms or balconies this is a place of public accommodation over which the city is tasked with enforcing the building code that's the question and the response has percentages and the last sentence there um it, it basically and i'm sorry i have to read this to you in any event, according to Hammett and Edison, the maximum calculated 
exposure level inside the top floor space of the subject building is 8.3% of the FCC public limit. And the highest level at any top floor balcony is 43%. So not an engineer, and I wanna make sure I understand what's 8.3% of the FCC and what's 43% of the FCC public limit. It helped me have some understanding of that. Before they answer that, Ed, okay. I'd like to add on something to that. Okay. Uh, because I'm obviously not technically minded in this area, as we all are. What is in, in this room, for instance, in comparison to, uh, because we do have signals, RF signals in this room, how does that compare with um, what they've written in this comment? I mean, is it 4% in this room or is it 8% in this room? What is it? In yeah, so you're looking for what's, what's, yeah, I'm looking for a what's, the sc what's the scale? Yeah, I'm yeah. looking for a comparison. Yeah. And just so a if the normal engineer, room. Yeah. If the engineers could help us out in understanding the scale of what percentages mean. Yeah. Right. So Raj, you had addressed that earlier, but we'd like a more a specifics with respect to the 8% exposure inside the, the unit and 43% on the balcony, please. Yeah, I'm happy to elaborate further on that. Um, so 100% of the FCC limit means that that's at the limit. So that's 100% is the allowable FCC limit. So if you're at 8.3%, that means you're about 12 times below the limit. Okay. Uh, similarly, 43, so 50% would be half. So 43% means you're a little bit less than half of the FCC limit. Um, so hopefully that, that clarifies what, what the percentages mean. Uh, and then to answer the other question of what would be the levels in, in a room, um, typically inside a room like you're in now with uh, computers and possibly wireless microphones and Wi-Fi routers, uh, I'd say the levels would be about one or 2% of the FCC limit. That's obviously without taking any, any measurements, just in general. Okay, we appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. So can I ask um can I ask um the assistant city attorney a question? Um right. I'd like to frame a motion, but I just need some clarification. So it sounds to me like we could include a condition that would require the building owner and and the um and the applicant to notify the residents who are immediately adjacent to the units and offer them post-construction testing if they if they want to. But what is unclear is whether or not we can require as a condition that, and I think it would be the building manager, um, notify future residents of the um, uh, of the fact of these these um, installations, mm -hmm. and so I guess that's my question: Can do we have to separate that and perhaps take this up as a future agenda item, um, or is this something that for this particular approval could be included? Take that on, Alan. Before they answer the question, Alan. So what? I'm just curious about what, what you're trying to propose here is what if they do do the testing and it comes out at 60, 70%, which may not, but what happens if they do go over that limit? Does that mean the whole program is gone? Project is gone? Or No, I don't think so. But I think it's more about letting people, you know, information so that the people who are living there would have that knowledge. Okay. Maybe they would choose not to live there. All right. Thank or maybe you. they wouldn't. Maybe they wouldn't care because it's so low. Right. Okay. So we'll ask uh, Karen Salama to answer that for us. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, at this point in time, the applicant is not um, the building owner and they're not here right now. My, that's my understanding of this issue. And it sounds like um, Mr. Orner prefers this to be done through the building owners. So in that case, it seems like this would need to be a separate issue and we should approve um, 
the facility, um, you can offer that the applicant send the notice, but that's where I would leave it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna make a motion that we deny the appeal and approve the project with a condition that the applicant by certified mail notify the residents of the immediate units to the installations and offer them post-construction testing if they would like it. All right. second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion under the motion? Yeah, I want to make sure I understood that um, that the post construction test would be offered, but you're not proposing that that go on for future testing if an occupant requested it. I don't think that we can do that. I think that if we want to impose something like that, or if we want to impose something like notification, I really think that has to be a separate city ordinance is what I'm kind of hearing. And it probably needs to be handled separately from this. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that I heard it correctly. Um, and, and we all, we know this is emerging law and we know that there's changes coming constantly. So there may be a future opportunity to address this for um, legacy notices for properties so that there is a mechanism uh, put forward where people have an opportunity to make a choice. But I don't think it's on this one. I think it's, uh, right. I, I agree with the motion. Okay. And, and I think the point is that people have a right to know and yeah. make that decision. And, uh, and, and, and that's kind of the way that I see it. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? I, if it's not inappropriate, may, can I uh, just mention, you may want to require that a copy of the testing procedures and results be provided to the tenant and to the city. Thank you. Was that all right with the motion and the seconder? It's just yes. another. Yes, card. I would like that added. Another yes. safeguard. Yeah, I was presuming the test would have to be uh, through our ordinance post-construction. Is that in our ordinance that we have a post-construction report currently? No, I don't think so. Okay. I, don't, I don't believe it's in the ordinance, but it is a condition of approval. Okay. So we're listing it today as a condition. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, hearing no more discussion then, we'll do a roll call. Council Member Albert? Yes. Council Member Williamson. Yes. Council Member Hoppe. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Mayor Roberson. And yes. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time, your consideration, your thoughtfulness. And we are adjourned. And I'll be joining a Peninsula Water Management District uh, meeting in 16 minutes. <laughs>